I'd like to now welcome to the stage, Karina Longworth. Come on up. Thank you, Lars. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it's incredible to see so many people here for a really strange film. Um, can I see a show of hands of anybody who's seen this film? One, two. <laughs> I'm seeing two. Um, so if you've read my book and gotten about 300 of the 500 pages in, um, you have learned something about this film that I hope that not many of you know. Um, there's, there's a big surprise that happens about 45 to 50 minutes into this movie. Um, and when I first saw this film, like my jaw was hanging down. Um, it really is, um, it, it really is the kind of thing that like is why we have spoiler warnings. Um, so I don't want to say too much about the film, but um, the main star of it is Jean Peters, who was an actress who was under contract to 20th Century Fox in the 1950s. And she was involved with Howard Hughes um, from the day of his spectacular plane crash in 1946 when he flew an experimental plane that he had designed into a Beverly Hills neighborhood and suffered terrible injuries that which should have killed him but didn't. Um, he met Gene Peters the day before that, and then they were involved in one way or another until 1971. Um, and they finally married in 1957. And um, for part of that, that marriage, they actually lived together in the same house, which was very unusual for Howard Hughes. Um, so Jean Peters was one of many brunette actresses that Howard Hughes was um, involved with during this time. Um, she was not what you would be considered today or even then a major star. She was always kind of on the second tier of people at 20th Century Fox fighting for the scraps that weren't going to people like Marilyn Monroe. Um, she did appear with Marilyn Monroe in one film called Niagara in which um, you can sort of see some of the interesting things about Jean Peters' persona in which she's, she's coded as somebody who's very beautiful but not sexy in a way that's, that might kill you, <laughs> the way that Marilyn Monroe often was. Um, uh, but in this film and in another film, which some of you might have seen called Pick Up on South Street, directed by Sam Fuller, um, she is portraying a more dangerous sexuality. And in, in this film, it's in the context of the turn of the century, small town America, in which she's playing a young woman who just wants things that are not available in this small town. And that gets everybody into a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm really excited for you Welcome to see it to and to talk Korean about it um, Hi, afterwards. Everybody. And I hope you enjoy, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, before we get started, there was something I was going to say in the Q&A that I forgot to say, which I think is pertinent, which is that this movie is apparently the first movie David Lynch remembers having seen. Um, <laughs> so wow. <laughs> apparently his parents took him to see it at the drive-in when he was a child, and he woke up in the backseat of the car and only has hazy memories of it. But I mean, minus the supernatural yeah. stuff, this movie is very Twin Peaksy to me. Yeah, it is. Well, Lynch was born in like what, forty six. This is fifty two. So he's like a six year old kid in Montana walking. That's awesome. <laughs> that is that really. Oh man. Now, where did you hear that? Is that? I read that. I think on um, maybe a film comment blog, okay. a cinephile blog. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, well, let me geek out just for a second and say how much I just love uh you know what you're doing you know you're i've just spent so many hundreds i don't know how many hours i think i've listened to about 90 percent of uh all your podcasts it's a word you know word gets around thank you so much word gets around and i mean we all go through this world as you know film people and we think we know a lot you know you but you i just so appreciate uh the deep dive you know and i think you've probably kind of such an independent, spirited way, created, I don't know, is yours the, the best job in the world where you get to just watch all movies and, uh, I don't know, you've created your own, I don't know, format or something. Well, I think you have a pretty good job, too. <laughs> yeah, besides <laughs> I'm, being I'm a I'm also a major fan but, of yours. Oh, thank you, but I, I feel like you, 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 there's sort of like an indie film spirit to what you're doing, even though it's like old Hollywood and, and that, just the way you're doing it. Yeah, I just appreciate so much. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I did. I did definitely start it 
um, completely by myself in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a cry for help on some <laughs> level of just like knowing that I wanted, knowing that I could do this kind of research and writing about old movies and they're not really being a format out there yeah. and having to try to create of cre basically create this thing that was in my head to prove to people what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just the love for, you know, like what we're trying to do here at the film study, you know, just, you know, wasn't that a beautiful print, you know, we showed tonight. That's, this is just, it's, it's really special. So I just feel like just when you think, you know, younger people aren't, don't care as much about, you know, the history of our industry and all that, there you are with this loving, a uh, very relevant view, and your and your particular viewpoint is so fresh too. Just um, thank you for calling know. me younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to you know, um, <laughs> us old guys. So um, anyway, um, wow. So this movie, it's a bit of a trick. You know, when we were talking about it, you didn't tell me, or we didn't really discuss it too much. But I thought, oh, Jean Peters. You know, she was. I guess I, other people claim to be Hughes' widow. Uh, but uh, she kind of was. I mean, she was a wife to him for, for those years and all that. But I thought we were going to see uh, a movie that she was in. All of It's kind of a trick when you lose her halfway through. It's like going to see that Janet Lee movie, uh, yeah. uh, Psycho or something. It's like, oh, I guess she's not in the movie anymore. So And her name's in the title, too. I know, I know, but this is kind of an epic ambition, you know, to this movie. It's in technical. There are not that many movies, you know. It was just the especially. I mean, this movie was considered a B movie for Fox in a way. It's not their top line stars, no. and so that just the fact that they did say, "Well, why not shoot this one in Technicolor?" <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, because I thought they reserved that really for the ones that were the big, big box office. And Henry King, who I like a lot, that's one of the reasons I had I had never seen this. But I'm a big fan of, you know, a lot of his movies. I just think he's a really kind of forgotten, but just really top rate, one of those great Hollywood careers that goes back to his first films were in the teens, and his last film was in like 1960, early 60s, just one of those 50-year careers. And, you know, he just made, to me, I always thought one of the best Westerns ever, you know, Gunfighter, uh, his Jesse James from 39 is, is just great, also tel Technicolor. So I just always... Thought he was a great storyteller, really interesting director, so I was glad to see one more by him. But this movie is so, uh, you know, it was kind of a Hughes, if we were talking about Hughes tonight and your book, which is lovely, by the way. I'm so happy to have read. Karina's book is amazing. You better get it. And uh, you have a chance to have her sign it tonight, it sounds like. But um, uh, I've just enjoyed your book so much. And I thought I knew a lot about Hughes, like everything. And I grew up in... Uh, the Houston area, my dad worked at Hughes Tool, and, you know, at my age, he died when I was a freshman in high school or something, and it's just the legend of Hughes, you know, you think you know something about somebody, but I just really appreciated, um, you know, how much more, and to see it through these, these women's eyes, I had already, already always heard those stories, but, uh, you know, what a, what a, what a crazy life, you know, it's like, I always saw him as this kind of swashbuckling, you know, weird guy, but all that, but what you reveal is so, so enlightening, and it seems very relevant, too, you know, just, he reminds me a lot in some strange way of our current president. Yeah. Has that hit you? <laughs> Absolutely, I mean, I yeah. think, and as I'm doing press for the book, people want it to be, more, I guess they, their first inclination is they want me to talk about create, drawing a straight line from Hughes to Harvey Weinstein, or some really? of the people in the film industry who we've discovered have abused their yeah. power sexually but i find i actually find more parallels to trump in terms yeah. of publicity i mean if you guys read the book you'll find out that hughes was somebody who had this persona as being shying away from publicity but he hired publicists his entire life and yeah and a lot of this persona of being somebody who shied away from the public eye was something he engineered through publicity. Exactly, it was all this facade. I had no idea. You think, oh, he's this reclusive guy, and in my entire lifetime, I mean, he was just this guy living in a hotel where he'd buy all, it was just these rumors about him, but it was kind of shy, so I thought all the stories were either hard-earned, and it tur turns out, kind of like our president, he had great relations with tabloids, because what he was doing had no real substance to it. I mean, he was one of, he wasn't interested in the arts, he was a big <laughs> spectacle kind of guy. Um, 
And so he was kind of creating this persona through tips and through his special relation with kind of Luella Parsons and, and all that. So I, I, it, it's pretty fascinating how much of that. But he, that said, he was, uh, I mean, what a life, you know. The, just, he was a gutsy guy, but he got people killed, <laughs> you know, yeah. who, who were working with him. He's just, you know, yeah, I mean, he's, he's kind of, he's crazy on the one hand, but oh. That's actually one of the things that was not hidden in publicity. It was pushed out there, the fact that four men died in the making of Hell's Angels. This was in Photoplay magazine, which was what the studios used Come to get ad- your money's worth, right? To right. advance so like the pub like the publicity they wanted out there. Like they thought that this was good publicity, the idea that this was the most dangerous movie ever made. It kind of was, but yeah. in a, not in a not in a good way. And then he was in other accidents. I mean, God. He survived so many. I guess one of my favorite quotes I read in your book was uh, one of his, was it Noah Dietrich? One of his main guys was giving an interview say, Oh, Hughes will never die in an airplane accident because he had been in a bunch and always, always survived. He says, He's going to die by, you know, a woman with a 38. That, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what's yeah. going to kill him. So. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's what Hughes wanted to believe was yeah. that. He would he would go out in in some manner involving sex, and actually, I mean, his death is he dies alone, yeah. very sick. Um, the only people around him are people who are paid to be there, yeah. and so there is like just even though I don't have a ton of empathy for Howard Hughes because of the various things I chronicle in the book, like I yeah. do have empathy for a guy who dies in that way just as a human being. Yeah, and who knows what he was suffering? Clearly, he had OCD. I think what they you know, tr- tracked in, in the aviator, and, you know, clearly he had some some condition probably from birth, and then given his parents' situation, and, and then who knows all the traumatic head injuries, and I don't know. Just yeah, the head injuries was, I mean, something that I think that I, w- just doing this research over the past three years, I was able to understand that aspect of it better mm. than I would have previously because just recently there's been so much more research about how repeated head injuries, repeated concussions can really change a person's personality. Yeah, CTE and you know the paranoia, but he had that pretty early on. Just he also reminds me of our president with this his controlling his kind of pathological lying. Absolutely. And you know, it was just like some weird game, but the control of others and that reminded me kind of in, in this movie, you know, like a man who's trying to control everything to, to such fatal, you know, ends. And yeah, I mean, others. this Jean Peters made this movie five years, I think, before she marries Howard Hughes. But in some way, she's acting out what their marriage would be like. I mean, yeah. he Howard Hughes kept her often sequestered from him. Like, they'd be living at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and she'd be in one bung- bungalow, and he'd be in another bungalow. And But he... So she would never see him, but he would exert total control over her life up to and including specifying what she could order from room service and blocking calls to her room and making sure that she was followed if she ever left the room. Yeah, and the punchline being he had other little starlets and other bungalows nearby saying he was out of the state or, you know, he would be back and he was, you know, 50 feet away. But just, you know, crazy, all those people on his payroll just... What an insane, uh, you know. That's what happens when you inherit that much money from your father. Yeah. <laughs> Yet another parallel. Yeah. The parallel. Let's face it. The yeah. parallel. But that said, he's a weird guy. He's, um, but th- there were a lot of stars who they truly had affection for him. And Gene Peters never said anything like bad about him. I think he wasn't. Did he love women? Did he hate women? What's your, what's your opinion? It's so complex. Well, I mean, I, I can't say that I saw a ton of evidence of him loving women in general. Right. Um, certainly there were specific women. like He he wooed I, them, though. Well, he he wanted, doesn't sound like he was a rapist. You know, like he was no, a, and I don't, he, a lot of romantic gestures and, you I, know, was flying in and in its plane and sweeping you off your feet. You know, he had that going for him. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that he liked the seduction aspect of it. My book's called Seduction. Yeah. Um, but I think he was also a collector. Yeah. And he, the, a possessor, thi- the yeah. thing he liked to do was take women off the market so that other men couldn't have them. And so he, there were periods of his life where he would propose to multiple women oh, yeah. over a span of a few months and they all would have a ring and they all would 
think that that ring meant something. And what it meant to Howard Hughes was that this woman wasn't going to sleep with other men and wasn't available to other men. They, he owned them now, but he was not planning to follow through on the promise of marriage. Yeah, so how do you think his relation with Gene Peters is different than, say, some of the others? Well, certainly they were involved with one another for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's different explanations for that. I mean, I think he he did really like her, and he didn't want her to be involved with other men. Um, as far as why they actually got married 11 years after they first met in 1957, right. there are arguments that he was in a situation. Um, he had been the owner of TWA, and he was getting pushed out of that company. Um, and there were people within his own company who were kind of jockeying for control, and there was an effort underfoot to try to um, have him declared uh, mentally incompetent so that other people could take over his money and his companies. Um, but if you are a married man, your wife has to approve something like that. So coincidentally, while all of that was happening, he elopes with Gene Peters uh, in Nevada, mm -hmm. and then they, they, they do live together in a house for a while, but it is not what you would call a conventional marriage. No. no, no. <laughs> yeah, there was nothing ever conventional. He didn't aspire to conventionality, even though he had that early marriage, I guess for his, you know, I don't know, for the Houston socialite, you know, that was early on. I don't know, what, it, what was he thinking there? Was there some kind of, um, I don't know, he was trying to be conventional initially, but he had no intention. No, he, no intention of having a conventional marriage. I mean, no. it seems that he married his first wife because he was trying to prove to his family right. and the people at his father's company that he was an adult. Right. Who he secret, he was, only goal was to buy them all out and never see them again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Mm. What got you going on Hughes? Was it, what, what was your first, because he's not like a great, filmmaker and he's not a great studio head he's not he, his place in hollywood is just odd yeah. ultimately i mean he covers a great swath you know from the silent era into the 50s late 50s i guess he owned a studio kind of ran it in the ground but he w were movies but he loved movies though that was the he did. if you think like all he did the last part of his life was watch movies you know it sounds like you know yeah. i remember there were Saturday Night Live skits and stuff around the time he was dying. <laughs> Do you remember any of these where he's eating banana nut ice cream and watching Ice Station Zebra just over and over? That was one of his favorite films, and he did yeah. watch it over and over again from these hotel rooms. Um, yeah, but, but everyone knew he, he just watched movies, just and a lot of them, I think, because they had women in them that he liked or yeah. you know no end of Jane Russell movies yeah no he bought it at one point when he was living in a hotel room in Las Vegas he bought the local television station so that he could make requests <laughs> because he liked to stay up all night watching movies and so he would call them and it, it started out with him just calling this TV yeah. station all the time and being like why don't you show more Gene Peters movies technically he was still married to Gene Peters <laughs> but he just like didn't want to live anywhere near anybody and so he didn't want to see her in person but he wanted to see her on the TV I know so he wants to see her on TV, he wants to see films, but yeah. my favorite little bit, it's, he's, he's getting, he took over the top floor, he's in the penthouses, he's been there, overstaying his welcome, and the hotel's like, you know, we have someone else booked, you gotta get out of here, and then he doesn't get in touch, with them, and they're getting kind of desperate, they, and they slide a note under the door, you know, like, you gotta go, and he slides a note back, like, if I buy the hotel, can I stay? Or how, how much was it cost to buy the hotel? And they slid another note back, like 13 million. And he's like, okay. He bought it. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think that maybe they were like, what would he not pay? Like, what would yeah. be too much for Howard Hughes? And, and so they put that number and he was like, it's sold. Probably, probably worth like six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of like when Bugsy buys the house. And, you know, like, oh, man, big personalities. I mean, he, he found the field. I mean, yeah, he could have had Hughes Tool and probably made a lot more money running a convention, especially in that era when he inherited that. I mean, he could have. Yeah. He ends up the world's richest guy or one of the world's richest anyway, but he just he picked the one industry where you can be kind of crazy <laughs> and get away with it. 
It didn't work so well in, in the aviation industry, and that's why he right. ultimately got pushed out of TWA. But when he sold TWA, that's what made him the richest man, mm. um, because he got a, he got a check for like two hundred and seventy five million dollars. Back when that was a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trump wouldn't think so. But. So, um, well, I don't want to totally hog it. If you, I know if, if some of you have questions about this movie, or if you have crescents for Karina or anything, just include them in, and we'll. We, we can keep talking. Um, if people didn't hear, he asked what was the inspiration for starting my podcast. Um, well, I had stu- I'd always been interested in old movies. I had gone to graduate school, and I studied Hollywood cinema of the 20th century in graduate school. But then I just uh, kind of immediately got a job as a film critic of new movies. Um, and I kept doing that for about 10 years. And then I, I sort of burnt out because... As a critic for a newspaper, you're expected to see everything and have an opinion about everything. And, and you know, I mean, there are a lot of good movies that are made, but I'm not interested in a lot of movies, especially a lot of mainstream movies. And I still was so interested in old Hollywood, and I, yeah. I felt like I never got, I never ran out of things that I was interested in from the past. And so it just became this thing of trying to figure out how do I get back there? Like, how do I get to the point where I can make a living watching the old movies and learning about them. And then I just kind of started hearing this show in my head, and then I just had to try to figure out how to make it. Wow. So, I don't know. I just, I just, I don't know. I'm just so thankful <laughs> that you, you, I can't tell you. It's just, it's so great that, and I just hope, you, you know, you're sharing your passion. I just hope a lot of young people are, you know, people who think they like movies just go straight to your podcast, who think movies started with, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever, you know, just keep going, keep going, you know. I've just learned so much from, Thank you. you know, each of, each of those, you know, the deep dives you do on, like, Joan Crawford and, you know, just, but, uh, you know, Charles Manson's Hollywood, that was, I, I could list them all, but, nah. you know, I just love the way you, you put things together, you know, Gene and Jane particularly, you know. That was, that was, really, what's, what's next? What, what's the, going to be next year? Well, right now I'm think? finishing up a season that I had done, I, the first half of, about um, the book Hollywood Babylon, where yeah. I'm like fact well, checking these stories. Thanks for debunking so much of that. <laughs> Some of it's just kind of anger. It's so much of that's just BS. So, right. And I think for, that it's yeah, like, it's important not to have big lies out there. Yeah. I mean, I mean we li- it's a myth so. industry, <laughs> but it's really, you know, come on. Yeah, I, I think for the thing about Hollywood Babylon is that it's still a lot of people's gateway to yeah. these kinds of stories. And so I just thought it, w- it would be good to go on the record and be like, this is where he's getting some of this stuff. This is what he's distorting. And this is what I think is the truth. So um, next week, we have a, a episode from that series about Mary Astor, who um, kept a diary about her sex life that yeah. was brought into court in 1936 by her husband when they were fighting over custody of her daughter. Um, and yeah, we're going to do a total of um, eight episodes from that series mm-hmm. running through the end of January. And then I have nothing planned after that. So um, we'll see. We'll see what comes to mind. What? If people have suggestions, let me know. Okay. Either yeah, I like the- here or on the internet. Yeah, I mean, because... That's what I appreciate about the the current series is because yeah, Hollywood you don't really need to make up stuff. There's so much. The truth is so great anyway. You don't need to em- embellish. I mean, even though the industry's based on that, it's, it's I don't know. Get it, get it. The truth. Do you get um, much feedback when you do it about living people like Jane Fonda, for instance? Did, did you ever hear from Jane? Like you did this? No, I haven't. I haven't heard life. from. Yeah. I haven't heard from her, but. Um, I would welcome it yeah. for sure. Um, I, especially that series, like I, I, you know, I think I was fair to her, so I hope oh, she wouldn't completely. be upset. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, some yeah. people, you know, I, I have like I did an episode about Warren Beatty and Madonna, and then later I met Warren Beatty, <laughs> and I, he didn't seem to know about the episode. Okay. Um, and then like the mutual friend who introduced me to Warren Beatty after we met, I was like, oh, a good. It seems like he didn't listen to that episode. I'm so thankful, and she's like. I forgot about that episode. He can never hear that. Oh, can you wow. take it down? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I didn't take it down. I don't know if he's heard it. He can never hear it. I'm sorry, Warren. It's not that bad. <laughs> Come on. A younger Warren Beatty, wouldn't have, he would have heard it. He yeah. would have been a little more thorough. Yeah. You wouldn't have got away with that. 
it was not more popular when it was released. This, no, I mean it. This movie did not hit. make much of a splash when it when it was released. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm really fascinated by movies kind of in this vein from the 1950s yeah. that are dealing with, you know, like the American dream, for lack of a better term, and, right. and are often just really dark. I mean, all of the William Inge movies and, and everything like that. So I think this is um, a really interesting example because it, it you think it's going to be this work of nostalgia about how great America is and then just things keep going wrong in the most lurid, strange ways. I know. Like the end progress of your town growing and prospering is the mob comes to town. Yeah. <laughs> but that's... <laughs> From that's, 110 miles away. Yeah. They're going to come, oh, yeah, hey, I'd hate to see these windows broken. It's like, we've made it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we're part of America now. Yeah. We're not some little backwater. Yeah. Oh, God, it's really, it's dark. It's sad. <laughs> And let's it's all, also let's the, all moan together but, about the but, fate you know, of Nellie. Historical perspective, it's early 50s, and they're, they're really talking about the 19th century, or his relation with her at the beginning, that control that you could not tell your wife where you're moving to. I mean, that seems <laughs> insane. So in 1952, are they saying, oh, look how far we've progressed? Like they're sort yeah. of making fun of 50 years ago, or not making fun of, obviously, but drawing a contrast to the present day? I think that there is there is some stuff that where you're supposed to be, be it's it is supposed to be relevant to the present day just because by that point it'd been several years since this this gender and culture clash after World War II where men came back and so women who had gone to work were supposed to go back into the house and they were supposed to forget about these other roles that they had taken and just go back to the past. Yeah, yeah no matter as we continue to learn as Hollywood just learned in the last couple of years just as far as you think you've come you you haven't you know you're always gonna I don't know it's it's always a shitty time <laughs> for women <laughs> I mean there's never a good time but it hasn't gotten much I don't know it's just it's not never doesn't get much better oh, I, I definitely think it's intentional that the film is doing a lot I mean it's yeah. epic in scope and just in terms of the time period and the different genres. I mean, it moves from being uh, basically like a, a corset melodrama <laughs> into something more feverish and heated. And then there's these musical aspects and then it becomes a gangster film. And then it kind of comes full circle. I love that circle. about it. I love that because yeah. it's, it's obviously biting that off. It it's, has those kind of epic intentions for itself. And I, I don't know, I think it achieves that. Yeah. I mean, when I was sitting in the back watching you guys watch it and you know, there was a lot of laughter. And I, I think that oftentimes when you guys were laughing, like there are things in it that are funny. I mean, like like some, especially some of Jean Peter's reactions to the situation she's, or, she's in, you know? I mean, and then sometimes it's, sometimes we bring that lens to it because we're coming from the future looking at the past. Um, but I, I do think that it is absolutely intentional to bring all of these different types of responses together in this film. Thanks, Susan. That that's a lot of very good question, um, and I I, I don't the think genres mash up the question. I don't know that I can answer all of it, um, but I I mean I agree with you that it it is really disappointing when Nellie dies, um, because especially at that moment like she's really yeah. taken control of the film, and you oh. I, the first time I saw it I. I was assuming that the focus of the movie would then switch to her in Chicago and like yeah. maybe something terrible would happen there and then she'd have to come back to the small town and like learn her lesson that she belo belonged at home but at least like she would get away. But it, it is like, it's devastating when she's and, ripped from the picture. And what's it saying that here's a woman who finally strikes out on her own is immediately killed, you know? It's like, yeah. it's like <laughs> Hayes Code, like, well, if they do that, they can do all that, but they have to be killed at the end. You know, well, like, absolutely. You know, you I mean, that's the definitely gangster. what, like the, what the Hayes Code was doing. And but I also think that like a movie like this is sort of having it both ways. Like technically, it is adhering to the Hayes Code and saying this is an unfaithful wife who is not happy with her lot in life and she must right. die. But then it also elicits this emotional response in yeah. the viewer. If anybody in the fifties was watching this movie and being like. 
it's terrible that she got punished that way. And I don't care about this guy. And now I have to watch this movie for another hour and 10 minutes with this guy. <laughs> He's the then oppressor. Then that's a subversive thing, you know? Yeah. And I think that ultimately, like, I mean, that was my reaction when I first saw the movie. Like, now I have to watch the movie about this guy. But then right. because the movie is so strange, it, it, like, reels you back in, or at least it did to me. Um, yeah. And, and also, she's this ghost that hangs over the whole film as well. Yeah. And then the granddaughter at the end to come back. Oh that's God. a granddaughter. Woo. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> she finally <laughs> did. She make it to? Was the wreck in Chicago? Did she they ever get there? <laughs> I I did notice that tonight. They do say like she was in a train wreck in Chicago. In Chicago so, so for all we know, she maybe she got off, off the train and like went to the dance hall and like bought you know the nice things and like Good. danced with men and then was like, all right, well I'm gonna go back because I do have two small children or whatever, <laughs> and then got killed trying to come back. Yeah. Okay, that's the story right there. So you've had your hand up for a while. You. I know, kind of, kind of devastating. Do you want to, do you want to give some context that in the yeah. book you have this, I don't know, just kind of disturbing HUAC type information. So I, I think a lot of people who know Ida Lupino have this idea of her. First of all, as being a great actress, mostly with film noirs, and then yeah. a director. She's a hero. The, yeah. She's a, a pioneering female director, the only female member of the Directors Guild in the 1950s. And if you know anything else about her, you you might know that she was a self-proclaimed liberal, um, and she talked about being anti-McCarthyism and anti-the blacklist. I read her FBI file, and her FBI file shows that she named names to the FBI. Um, and she actually told the FB gave the names of people who she was friendly with to the FBI and said, these people are communists and they tried to convert me. And she volunteered this information. She was, she did not, was not put under pressure to it wasn't it. public in front of Congress. No, was... she volunteered it behind the scenes because she was worried about her citizenship application. Um, so it's very troubling, and and it's but, um, yeah. you know it it is very difficult to reconcile. And I also, as I write in the book, I mean, I I feel like she was somebody who often presented one image so that she could get away with doing something else. And I think that this is a version of that. I mean, it's it's much it's much easier to reconcile her giving interviews where she says, "Well, I'm not really directing," you right. know. I I just she I, had to play that role to yeah. actually be doing what she's doing. Right. So it's easier to rec reconcile her saying, "I'm not a feminist," you know. I'm just you know taking charge of this movie, but it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Than it is to reconcile her to not be turning on her friends. And I know. And my man Sterling Hayden. Hayden, yeah, you know, Sterling Hayden Sterling is Hayden. Um, somebody who she socialized with, and then she gave his name to the FBI. And then he had to go be humiliated, but like so many. Well, that was talking about an awful time, but I don't know, such a complex time. You know, it's just one more survival story in some strange, some awful time. You know. So. Yeah, and it's. I mean, I get asked the question a lot of like, when you know horrible things about people, can you still appreciate their movies? And um, I think it's absolutely, in the case of Ida Lupino, I think it's absolutely important that we still watch the movies that she yeah. starred in and directed, uh, particularly the films she directed, because they're underseen, and, and most of them are very good. Yeah, you can't really, I, I agree, I agree. You can, uh, you can reconcile the horrible things. And a lot of it's, you know, it's the time, too. I didn't know Hughes was such a racist. Yeah. But, you know, you look at the time he was born, oh, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Why wouldn't he be, you know? And where he was. What's that? And where he was. Yeah. He grew up mm. in Houston, grew up in the South. I don't know. From that era. You have a question. So he was only involved, Howard Hughes was only involved in one uh, Catherine Hepburn film. Um, her, her career had kind of slumped, and then she was on stage starring in the Philadelphia story, and Howard Hughes said, let me give you the money to buy the film rights so that you can control the film adaptation. And so the, the film of the Philadelphia story made Catherine Hepburn a movie star again, and she continued to be a movie star until she died. So that's how he plays a role in reviving her Hollywood career. In addition to the fact that while her career was slumping, she suddenly became on the cover of magazines paired with him, 
while he was kind of at the peak of his celebrity as an aviator, having done this record-breaking flight around the world. So there had been sort of open conversation in gossip magazines and stuff about her sexuality and, and the, this idea that she wasn't a real woman. And then she starts appearing on the covers of magazines as Howard Hughes's girlfriend. The so. most real man of the time. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, well, that's a good example of him inadvertently doing something great for film by yeah. helping the Philadelphia story get made, but he's really just wooing her, whatever their relationship yeah. actually was. But it wasn't for to, to make a great film, probably. <laughs> <laughs> can we, we can all answer that. Not, there wasn't just one. No, obviously not. Um, but I, I did, I mean, I definitely felt like I was um, under pressure to take a lot of movies seriously that I wouldn't take seriously otherwise. Like, I, I'm not interested in comic book movies. And as somebody who, um, well, I mean, that's, I mean, it's my personal preference. People can like whatever they like, but it's just not what I'm interested in. And yeah. I, when I was a film critic, it was at this time where they were proliferating ever faster and... And it was considered that I wasn't doing my job because I wasn't interested in them. So then I had to question, do I want this job? Good one. So, um, well, I think we have room for one last question. I got the, you've had your hand up a long time. Well, I can't say that I would say that there's one place that is, you know, was the exciting place for me. Also, you have to understand that I, I stopped being a film critic in January 2013. So that was quite a while ago, and I'm sure if there was a hot spot then, it's moved on. Um, but I, I mean, one thing that I really miss is going to the Cannes Film Festival and, and being able to devote a week of my life to seeing movies that, you know, I live in Los Angeles now, and even in Los Angeles, a lot of foreign films and a lot of, of lower budget films don't get a significant release. And so to be able to go to film festivals and see things that are not, commercially mainstream in America is super exciting, and I do miss that. Yeah. Well, it's always, you know, these years at Hollywood was just, that we glorify now and have so much to say about and look at, it was always, there was always so many more bad movies than good movies, so much filler, you know, and all that, but the gyms are always there, so. And they are today, just as they were back then. You know, it's never a bad year for films, but it's got to be looking <laughs> and digging. And, um, well, I just want to, uh, you know, wish you keep doing what you're doing. It's important to a lot of us and continued success in everything you're doing. Get Karina's book. Um, you, you'll totally love it. And, uh, yeah, look forward to the next book. Please come back and visit us. And I will. And thank, thank you so, you much, so much, much for being with us tonight. Thank you. So, thank you, guys. Thanks.